Hello, this is Professor Stephen Swift of the Columbia Gorge Community College discussing the Middle Colonies, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. These colonies are called the Middle Colonies because they are between the settled British, the earlier settler, settled British colonies of Massachusetts to the north and Virginia and Maryland to the south. And here you can see James, Duke of York, who acquired these lands from his brother, King Charles II. He eventually will go on to become Charles's successor as King James II of England. Now he acquired these territories from the Dutch and they had originally settled in this area as early as 1638 when they established a trading post and settlement called New Sweden in present-day Delaware and southern New Jersey. Now the Dutch claimed New Sweden in 1655 took over the area which is now New York which they named the New Netherlands and invited any traders to come and do business in this area and so therefore from the very beginning the New Netherlands is a very vibrant area of trade and commerce and um, um, settlement from all over the world and they said that um, if you walk down the street in New Amsterdam, which eventually will become New York City, you could hear as many as 30 different languages and many other um, dialects. And so it was a very um, advanced, vibrant city. Well, in 1664, the Dutch and English were in the middle of another trade war, which we will discuss in a subsequent lec lecture on its impact on American trade through the Navigation Acts, and the English decided to take over the um, Dutch area of New Amsterdam. They sailed a sh uh, fleet in in 1664 and demanded the area. The Dutch were traders, not warriors, so they gave it up without a fight. The Dutch flag came down, the British flag came up, but otherwise life in the new area changed very little. Now King Charles II gave these lands to his brother, Duke of York, and this is part of the reason that the um, new area was called New York. Um, he gave the other area, which became New Jersey, to a couple of his friends on very easy terms, and they established freedom of religion and a demo uh, democratic system of government. Now, a lot of people from New England and the Long Island Puritans moved into this area. So in 1674, Berkeley sold his interests to two Quakers. The Quakers we have not discussed before, but they are a Protestant religion that is very different from the Puritans. They believe in an inner light, and this is a direct link between an individual and his or her God. And I say her advisedly because the Quakers were one of the most liberal groups in accepting both women and African Americans into their church. Women were preachers. In fact, there's a, a prominent woman a minister in the 1700s named Mother Anne who creates a religion off of the, uh, off of the Quakers called the Shakers. And we'll um, hopefully address that in a subsequent lecture as well. The Quakers, unlike the Puritans, were pacifists. They believed in letting um, li those who lived live however they want. Um, they did not believe in violence of any sort, and this will cause problems in these colonies where Quakers refused to fight even in self-defense. And they opened their church, like I said, to anyone. And the meetings, I mean the um, church services were in fact called meetings of friends because there was no minister as such everyone could speak everyone could share their inner light their relationship with God to the group and so often the society of friends or the Quakers would sit in an empty in a in a room and it would be silent everybody feeling the presence of God and their own religious experience um, very personally other times, women, men, African Americans, anyone could stand up and speak what their 
relationship to God was. So the Quakers adopt a very open constitution, a very open area. And so the middle colonies thrive with people that are feeling persecuted in the Puritan area and feeling a little desperate from Virginia, as we'll discuss in a subsequent lecture, um, from the overwhelming death and violence that the Southern living will entail. Now, Pennsylvania, as I said, was given to William Penn's father to pay off a debt. And William Penn is a Quaker. His father, though, was a member of, the, of Charles's inner circle. And he certainly helped the king, um, and the king, in order to pay him back, gave him some land in America. Well, when he died, William took this over. William had broken with his father as a Quaker. His father was um, very solidly in the Church of England. But William, upon his father's death, was very rich. So he settles the area, which is Pennsylvania, As a Quaker, he treated people very fairly, including the Native Americans, and he opened the settlement to anyone who believed in the Christian God. So this area of Pennsylvania, of the New World, called Pennsylvania, was extremely accepting and had the advantage of a little better climate than um, northern colonies with the harsh winters. and milder summers than the southern colonies and also the government he created was generally democratic it was pretty open to anyone now Penn kept most of Pennsylvania in his own family and his family with a group of Penn's friends and eventually his children when he passes on will become known as the proprietors and they will have the most land, they will have the most power in Pennsylvania, but they will be subject to the legislature, which is generally elected or, or popularly elected. Um, Pennsylvania grows very quickly. By 1685, there's almost 9,000 settlers. By 1700, the colony had doubled from that size. The colony produced wheat, corn, rye, and other products. Uh, much of this was sold off to the sugar plantations in the West Indies as they were producing only sugar in a very harsh slave environment. So the middle colonies are these um, basic four colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. About 10% of the population was slaves. Many people believe that slavery was only a southern institution. Um, during this time until the revolution, and we will discuss this change, as well later on um, there will be slaves throughout the new world or throughout the british colonies in fact if you go to 1820 there will still be several thousand slaves in new york although slavery is on its way to being um, outlawed in new york there will still be some hangover from this slave period um, way into the 1820s so this area, Pennsylvania, the Hudson Valley in New York, um, allowed colonists to spread out. The Germans moved in and settled um, in the western part of the colony. And cities started to grow very quickly on the seaboard. New York City, P Philadelphia, and these two would be the rivals for the largest city in the colonies. As I said, many settlers from all over, the Scandinavian Dutch, as a layover from New Amsterdam, um, outnumbered the English in New Jersey and Delaware. The Germans flocked to Pennsylvania, the fresh Huguenots to New York, and the Huguenots are a, uh, a segment of, um, of Catholic French who were not welcomed um, under the regime there. Um, early in the 18th century, the Scots and Irish start to settle in, Phil in Pennsylvania, um, in the back country of Virginia, which is the eastern side, and in the Carolinas. And as England moved into the 1700s, it actually boomed, so there were less 
poor settlers for the English colonies and if you had a choice you would come to what they started to call the best poor man's country and so um, opportunity was was ripe and these colonies did not discriminate they opened up the eastern land to settlers um, there was still prejudice and um, when we talk about Benjamin Franklin he was well known to have a bit of a resentment against the Germans in eastern Pennsylvania as far as how he viewed them eth ethnically but they were allowed to be involved in politics they were involved in the decisions of the colony now in New York the system of small farms or uh, uh, manorial um, system limited the opportunity to a smaller hand a smaller handful of rich settlers um, with some slave labor but generally hired labor started to develop in the north but land was available and tenants could get long-term leases on the on land um, in the in the middle colonies um, mixed farming was used and for the most part um, they were very comfortable areas to live in and enough jobs and the economy was was either good or booming during various times and so these areas grew very quickly Phil, uh, Pennsylvania I mean sorry Philadelphia profited from the trade and from the growth of the colonies and by 1750 had surpassed Boston with a population of 15,000 as America's largest city by 1650 some 50,000 Europeans had come to North America they were still mostly along the Atlantic seaboard and in the colonies Native Americans outnumbered Europeans 10 to 1 and in the 1650s African slaves were still rare and the French and Spanish colonization was relatively inconsequential as we'll see as the British colonies start to move westward and encounter what was known as New France and later on in the course or even in the second semester you'll see how loosely held the Spanish colonies were now by 1750 you had nearly a million settlers occupying the Atlantic seaboard and at this point you had a quarter of a million slaves and the Indians had either enveloped or retreated and at that point um, we're approaching the revolution and we'll discuss these aspects now New Spain and New France had also grown but they were still fewer than 20,000 inhabitants in those colonies. 